there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity brought to you by Bible Talk. Hooray. Hooray. We're glad you can join us and I want to greet you on behalf of Alice and myself and everybody who's a part of Bible Talk. I want to greet you in the precious, wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing on. Uh, we, we have for a number of weeks now, a number of weeks, been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. As that true picture of Christianity is Christ expects us to live it, mm -hmm. right? We've been through the Beatitudes, and um, in our last program, we talked about his statement that we are the salt of the earth. Yes. And we're going to go into that we are the light of the world. But before we do that, I'm going to take a little bit of an interlude to, to talk about evangelism. Evangelism 101. Because this the purpose of this is that Christ is preparing his disciples, us, to be that witness of him and his love out in the world, mm -hmm. proclaiming his excellencies. That's evangelism, right? So our ministry is to influence the world around us with the love of God. Basically, that's what evangelism is. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk now about, too, about evangelism and revival. But before I do that, I want to thank you, Father, yes, that you have revived us. Yes. That, Lord, with your word and with your love, you have brought us back to, from the dead mm -hmm. and into new life. We praise you and thank you for that. And we thank you, Lord God, that your word is a seed, an imperishable seed, that can lead others to new life. Okay. So I pray that this time in your word, Lord God, would touch other lives, encourage believers to share your love. And if any out there is listening to this, watching this, and they don't, know your love, mm. that they would come into contact with it now. And Lord God, that they would choose life in you. So we just praise you and thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Evangelism, the goal of evangelism is new life. Yes. Revival, right? Mm -hmm. But evangelism is not revival. Okay? Right. Uh, in, in the same way that if you're baking a cake, and they won't let me do that. But if you were making a cake, the goal uh, is the cake. But the baking is not the cake. The baking is the mechanism to get you the cake. In the same fashion, evangelism is God's mechanism for producing the revival, the new life. Okay? The focus of the Lord for his disciples was, and still is, that we would proclaim the good news, evangelize. Okay? This is, this he did. Right? Early in, after his temptation in the wilderness, when he encountered Satan out in the wilderness, yes. he stood in a synagogue in Nazareth and proclaimed that the words of the prophet Isaiah were being fulfilled in him. Mm -hmm. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Luke 4.18. To proclaim the good news, that's evangelism, right? And so he has commanded them, those disciples and us, in the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. We're to go out and evangelize, out wherever out is. Mm -hmm. When you walk out the, the door of your house, when you walk into the door of your business, when, we are to be those people who bring God's good news. And while there are specifically, you know, there's a five-fold ministry. God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, pastors, you, what, evangelists is in there. Yes. Okay, that was in. pastors and, and teachers. There is a specific ministry of evangelism, somebody who's devoted his full time to that. But we're all specifically, all Christians are evangelists in the church. All believers are called to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what Peter wrote, right? First Peter uh, 2, 9? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Alice is nodding. Okay. 
So that's what evangelism is. And I want to talk for a second about revival. I, I think one of, the, one of the people that I know of who is now going to be with the Lord, who was probably the most knowledgeable with his, with his knowledge and understanding of revival was a guy named Leonard Ravenhill. And it, he was born in Leeds, England, right? He lived uh, from, I think, 1907 to 1994. And he wrote a number of books, but one of the most famous and one that has changed my life many, 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 many years ago was called Why Revival Tarries. Why aren't we seeing that revival? And he said that revival, and I'm paraphrasing, revival is not about churches being filling empty pews. Mm -hmm. True revival is about God filling empty hearts. Right. Okay? And mm -hmm. there is a difference. Yes. You see, we can, you know, drive around the United States of America, and, and I don't know how this is, whether or not it's as true in other countries, but certainly, particularly in the southern United States, mm -hmm. during the summer. And you'll pass signs. church after church after church, and they'll have signs up. Revival, 7 o'clock Friday night. As you have often said. As I was often said. <laughs> well, let me, we, we can't schedule what the Lord is going to do. No. We can schedule what we're going to do. And we can't bring revival. We can we can schedule evangelism, yes. but we can't schedule <laughs> revival because you that's the work that's of the Holy happen. Spirit, okay? Mm -hmm. What we need to do is to humble ourselves. We need to pray. We need to seek God's face. Yes. We need to turn from our wicked ways. Mm -hmm. Then God will hear from heaven, and he will forgive our sin, and he'll heal our land. That's what it says in 2 Chronicles 7.14. See, so we can we can we can schedule that. We can schedule preaching the word. Mm -hmm. We can schedule our we can let's all get together at seven o'clock Friday night and repent. We can do yes, that kind yes, of stuff, right? Yes. But it seems that the church is focused on, you know, we, we think that revival and evangelism is getting those sinners out there to change their ways. It seems we have forgotten that true revival has to start with us changing our ways. Okay? Evangelism can be results oriented. In other words, you, you know, this is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You're looking for people to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. You're looking, that should be our heart. It certainly is God the Father's heart. You know, Peter wrote, God desires that none should perish, but all come to eternal life, right? So we can, we should be goal oriented. You know, our goal is to see people accepting the Lord. Mm -hmm. However, it can't be results driven because our evangelism can't be driven by or controlled by whether people accept it and receive it or not, okay? It's not about pleasing men, but it's about pleasing God. And all mankind, he said, all mankind needs to hear the gospel. Yes. We, we can't control whether they accept it or not. You know, God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel. How many men have been as used as powerfully as prophets as mm -hmm. the prophet Ezekiel? But he sent Ezekiel out saying to him, but, but you shall speak my words to them, to the people who sent him to, whether they listen or not, for they're rebellious, okay? So it doesn't depend on whether they're accepting it or, or rejecting it. It doesn't matter whether they're listening or not listening. Our commission, our command is to go out and spread and share the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, proclaiming the lost or the good news to the lost, proclaiming the good news, preaching the gospel, has a godly purpose, a desired result. This is what Jesus told Paul, mm -hmm. to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Mm -hmm. Acts 26, 18. So that is the purpose of evangelism, to open people's eyes when we, when we share the word, we should go back and pray that God would open the eyes of their hearts, that they would turn from darkness, all right? Yes. The purpose is to build the church of God, not to increase the size of a congregation, mm -hmm. right? That's right. And too often that seems to be our focus. It's about, well, getting people into the building, filling the pews, rather than filling God's, you know, God filling men's hearts. Not, not terribly long ago, well, it's actually a few years ago now. Actually, it's a little more than a few years. Mm -hmm. 
I was at a, a meeting of pastors in Orlando, Florida. I guess there were about a hundred of us, and we were seated at tables of ten. We were there. It was a we had breakfast together, and then had you know a prayer meeting and just some things. And I was sitting with the at a table of ten. And I was sitting with eight pastors who I had never met before. And it was interesting. We, while we were having breakfast and before breakfast, they were having conversations about the programs that they were running to build their churches, you know, what they were doing to bring people in. You know, there are people, there are church growth seminars, there are yes. growth, church growth consultants. Uh, I've run across some of this, and it's astounded me some of the things I, I've seen. You know, I, I, I encountered one time, I was invited to a small meeting, with a, a pastor who was coming into the town we were in to start a new church. And when we got together, I found out that his purpose was that we would have a focus group to determine what the color of his logo should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know of another church where they hired a, because they wanted the church to grow, become bigger in numbers, and they were building a new building. So they brought in a church growth consultant, and he told the pastor that he should grow a beard That's because it would be, make him look more contemporary. Okay. All right, so I, I've seen these programs, and it, it seems they're designed to draw people into the church building. So you, they make the church buildings more attractive. We're talking about that with these these seminars and these growth yeah. these build, church growth, growth seminars. Building, yeah. Yeah. They're leaning on their own understanding. Of course they are. Of course they are. Well, that's, that's, what, that, that's the whole idea. That's what I want to talk about. Because if we're going to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world and understand that that purpose is to carry the love of God and the light of the word, then we need to understand God's plan. Right. Not our plan, right. but God's plan, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So it's not about making the churches, church buildings more attractive or trying to make the music more attractive to people. And the most dangerous of all is to make the message more attractive to people, yes. right? Because I got to tell you, the message is is often not attractive until it touches your spirit. It's not attractive to the flesh. The father, on the on the other hand, and I said this to these other eight pastors that morning. You know, they're talking about their plans. I said, you know, I'm just curious. You know, have you seen this? Speaking of Jesus, right? The father spoke of the the coming Messiah through the prophet Isaiah, and here's what he said. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 53, those are the first two verses. And boy, go read Isaiah 53 if you want to see God's plan. So God's plan was not to make it pretty. God's plan was not to make it or Jesus attractive. Because it was Jesus who said, and I, am I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. John 12, 32. If I'm lifted up, he was lifted up. That was the horror of the cross. And the horror of the cross proclaimed the glory of God. Nothing proclaimed the love of God like the cross. Right. That is, by definition, where we see love. We know love by this. While we were yet sinners, he died for us, right? The ultimate sacrifice. Absolutely. So the, the plans, you know, it's, it's got to be the spirit that draws men, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to, I, I just talked about churches have plans, man has plans. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about God's plan. Yes, God's plan. And I, I have seen God's plan. And I see three methods of evangelism that make up God's plan. Okay. Paul wrote, wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and he said, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure do we have? I'll tell you what treasure we have. Thank you for asking. We have the love of God. The love of God, Paul says, has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the love of God. We have the Word of God. The Word of God has been written on the tablets of our heart. The treasure that we have is the Holy Spirit. The treasure that we have is the love of God. That's what we have of value. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, it's good. We go out and we do things, social things in the world, and we provide food for the hungry and clothing for the naked. That's good. 
But that's not the treasure. That's not the treasure. The treasure is the love of God and the Spirit of God. So now, if we have them in earthen vessels, I, I wish I had, I mean, you're going to have to work with me in here and, and picture some of the things, right? Those old earthen vessels, think of a clay pot. Now, you know, clay pots, earthen vessel, earth, clay, mm -hmm. they're fragile, right, first of yes. all? We are. He is the potter, and we are the clay. It says that so many times in Scripture. I mean, probably five times in the, in the prophet Isaiah. It, said, but, but in, it says in Jeremiah, he's the potter, and we're the clay. Right. So he has formed this earthen vessel out of clay, mm -hmm. right? All different sizes. All different sizes. Those earthen vessels, they come in different sizes. Some are this tall, some are that tall, some are that wide, some are that wide. But they're all fragile earthen vessels, yes. right? So the first method I see that God uses to reach other people is that filling. Mm -hmm. He has filled us with a treasure. He's filled us to overflowing, right? When Jesus was at the wedding of Cana, in the beginning of his ministry, right? It says it's his first miracle. He changed the water to wine. Well, he told the people when he was, his mother came and said, you know, they're, they're out of the wine. And he called the servants and he said, fill these water vessels. Fill them to the brim. Filled means full. Okay? There's not room for anything else. No, so there's not room for anything else. It's full. It's either otherwise it's not filled. Right. Okay. Right. It can have and a lot of it can have a lot in it. Still can get in but there. filled means filled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, on the day of Pentecost, it talks about how the believers were gathered, right? And it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance, right? Mm -hmm. Acts 2 4. And as I mentioned, the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 5 said that the love of God, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given mm -hmm. to us, right? Filled means full. David, King David, a man after God's own heart, I think one of the most beautiful things he said, Psalm 23, and you know, Psalm 23 is a, a psalm that so many people know, right? The Lord is my shepherd. And one of the things he says in there is, my cup runneth over. Evangelism is first and foremost about our love affair with Jesus Christ. Right? I want to say that. The first instance of new life after the creation, okay, was this. Now, Adam knew Eve. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord, a man child with the help of the Lord. Genesis 4.1. By the way, not to get distracted, but you've got to understand this. So many translations have tried to make that more understandable. You know, he knew even she conceived, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it says in the Hebrew. So some say, well, you know, he, he made love to her, he slept with her. It says that he knew her. And the Hebrew word for know is yada. Okay, and yada comes from the Hebrew word yad, which is the word for hand. Because that is an intimate knowledge. It's a touching knowledge. It's intimacy between two people. Mm -hmm. That was God's plan. You can look at the darkness of this world around you, and you see people having babies all over the place, mm -hmm. and love's not even involved, right? right? But God's plan was that two people, a man and a woman, that he brings together, mm -hmm. should have an intimate love that results in new birth. Right. But it comes from that touch, right. Okay. Your love affair with Jesus Christ, I promise you, will bring mm -hmm. forth new life. Yes. I wrote a song uh, many years ago. It's, uh, I just I say this, for, and the song is called Let Me Touch You. Mm -hmm. right? Come to me, all of you with pain. Come and see, call on my name. I will give you rest for your soul. Let me touch you, make you whole. That's... That is the sentiment. That is the word of Jesus Christ, right? If you don't think that the Lord is into intimacy, perhaps there's a part of Scripture that you've ignored. The Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. i got to tell you what, one of the reasons it gets avoided so much is because it's very intimate. Mm -hmm. All right? Yes. Okay. But that is, God wants... An, 
Christianity is romantic. It's, it's a romance. It is a romance. It's a, it's a, it is a romance. <clears throat> and you understand that. And it's all about that love. Mm -hmm. It is a love that should continually cry out, more, Lord, mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. I want more of you. Mm -hmm. Love is supposed to grow. That's why Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you towards one another grows ever greater. Our love for each other and our love for God is supposed to grow. But it can make a mess. People will call you a fanatic. Mm -hmm. It's like if I have a coffee cup, I drink tea, by the way. If I had a, if I had a coffee cup and I'm sitting here and I'm at a diner and a waitress comes over or I'm at home and Alice comes over and pours coffee into that cup and it gets to the brim, what do you do when it gets to the brim? You have a choice. Life is about choices. Mm -hmm. You can either say stop or you can say more. <laughs> My cup runneth over. More, Lord. Keep it coming. God will pour it into you as long as you're willing to say more. Mm -hmm. And if you're right... That's right. It is right. But it'll make a mess. Life can get messy in the spirit. Mm -hmm. That's when it becomes glorious in the spirit. That's when it becomes an adventure in the spirit. And if you really want a holy mess, mm -hmm. pray that he'll touch your life and turn it upside down. Yes. Think of that vessel. Like I said, picture this with a clay vessel. If it was filled to the brim and you keep pouring more into it, it's going to touch everything around it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, how about a little more dramatic? Mm -hmm. You fill up that clay vessel and then turn it, turn upside, it upside down up. and pour it out. Well, it's just going to splash over everything yeah. around it. That love, if you allow God to turn your life upside down, that love will pour out of you and touch everything around you. Mm -hmm. It says, now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 4, 18. He turned their lives upside down. Then, later, on the road to Damascus, as, as Saul of Tarsus is going to persecute Christians, he encounters Jesus, right? And he, Saul of Tarsus, says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you'll be told you what you must do. Acts 9. God turned his life upside down. Actually, he turned his life right side up. Yeah, it really was upside down. Because if you don't have a relationship, a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you're upside down. So let him turn you right side up. When I encountered Jesus, I'm just telling you this, on the day that I got saved, the day that I had a radical encounter with Jesus, near the end of that conversation, Jesus Christ said to me, you've had your life, now it's mine. Mm -hmm. He turned my life upside down, right side up. Mm. Hallelujah. And I thank God for it every day since, in the mm. 40 years since. Right? And when he does turn your life upside down, right side up, it's your attitude with what happens that others are seeing and, and draws them in. Absolutely. Because you know what? He came that we would have life and have it abundantly. He came that we would have joy and our joy mm. would be made full. This is what his love does in our life. And people have to see that. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's it's seeing it and hearing it that makes it the reality. Being the salt of the, the earth, as we talked about last time, it should make people thirsty for what we have. And it will if you'll live it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so he changed Peter's life, he changed Andrew's life, he changed Paul's life, he changed a lot of lives, he changed my life. But he said, and you will be hated by all because of my name. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. That's why Jesus said, that we, we need to count the cost. And in fact, the cost can be total. Picture again for a moment that clay vessel, the one that was overflowing, the one that's turned upside down. Now picture it sitting there, 
filled to the brim with water. Right? You got that picture in your mind? And all of a sudden, pow! Along comes a bat and smashes into it. What happens then? The water just bursts everywhere. Explodes. Explodes and bursts everywhere. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, but we're fragile, those clay vessels, right? Picture it. The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. Proverbs 10, 20. The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. High quality bells are often made out of silver. Silver bells. Right? Because mm -hmm. one of the qualities of silver, in addition to being a precious metal, it's because, because it's rare, is that it's sonorous. What sonorous means is that when it's struck, it gives off a beautiful sound. Jesus Christ was struck violently on the cross and love burst forth across all mankind and all time. He was struck and the sound he gave off was, Father, forgive them. Had it not been for that godly sound, that godly evangelism that still reverberates and resounds throughout the ages, there would be no new life possible, not even a hope of it. So in any of those three cases, we have to be willing, but passive participants, mm -hmm. all right? We do the evangelism, but we don't do the revival. Right. Exactly. Evangelism is the love of God flowing through us. Mm -hmm. And as the writer of the letter to Hebrews said, it is the Lord who will equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Right? Hebrews 13, 21. Mm -hmm. God filled you with his love and his word, and he will cause it to come out. So willing becomes the key word. Right? We have to be willing. Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw before mm -hmm. he went to the cross that night. And he knelt down and began to pray, mm -hmm. saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And yet, not my will, but thy will be done, Luke 22. You have to be willing to do the work of an evangelist. You have to be willing to have the Lord fill you to overflowing, even if it makes a mess around you. You have to be willing to let the Lord turn your life upside down because he'll be turning it right side up. You have to be willing to understand, to take those blows, to take that persecution that comes, because what will happen when that vessel is broken is God's love will explode from you and touch lives around you. And like on that day, that Roman soldier, that Roman centurion stood there and saw this and he said, surely this was the Son of God. Hallelujah. Evangelism is not our little meetings. Evangelism is allowing God to use us as he chooses. No matter what. No matter what. No matter what the cost. Mm -hmm. But Father, we thank you that you can use us. We thank you, Lord God, for the great gift that you've poured into us, your Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the great gift, the gift of your love, the great gift that you've put your word in us, Lord God. Lord, help us to have that utter willingness to serve you, regardless of the cost, that others might come to know your love, that others might be drawn into the kingdom, that others would become part of this body. Lord God, help us to be instruments of your love to touch other lives day after day after day until that day that you come. Father, we just ask that in the precious, wonderful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you and goodbye until next time when we will talk about the light Bye. of the world. Hallelujah. Bye-bye. Come to me all you Call on my name I will give you Rest for your soul Let me touch you Make you whole I've seen your suffering Heard what you pray children 
and some years pain.